<laughs> Welcome everyone to the Wood from the Trees with David Cuddy, my Jamie, aka Colin, and Gary Daverin, aka Beyond the Bike Trail Edge. Why do you call it that? No, Beyond the Trails Edge. Yeah, why do you call your Instagram that? I think just everything I do, I just kind of go that bit further. Beyond the Bike Trails Edge. Did you do that before you were building the bike trails? No, I've had that. I've had that Instagram name for a good few years. Just beyond the trail's edge, because I think all the bike adventures we do, we kind of go on, go beyond the trail, like kind of find new trail. Yeah, it used to just be Gary. <laughs> Gary, just yeah, Gary, Gary Everett. Yeah. yeah, that's what you need. And you you used that a lot when you were going all over the place doing stuff with the uh, bikes and that. Yeah. But um, I, I'm I'm a little bit sad. I'm a, I'm a little bit emotional right now because. Colin just told me that brandy is made from white wine and I didn't know and I'm devastated over it. Yeah. It, that's why it tastes shite. Oh, it tastes lovely. It's wine distilled twice so it's wine that's winier than wine. You're a beer person. Uh, whiskey and Guinness. Guinness? Yeah. I would have never put him down the for a The odd time of beer. The odd time of beer. Your beer and wine. You drink wine. Yeah, I love wine. Yeah, I like red wine. Red wine. Vicky got me into red wine. I love it now. Although you could... Drink a bit too much of it now and it can give you some sickening. No, it tastes like vinegar. It doesn't all taste it like does. vinegar. It all tastes like shit. No. no brandy is a good... You have to have a good palate for brandy. <laughs> <laughs> I just mowed myself in the ear with the microphone. But um, the first time I met Gary, we were working on the mountain, as we do. And at night time, when it was dark in the middle of the winter, he'd see these lights tearing down the wood. And you'd be like, what the fuck? There's no road there. What is going on? And then Greg said to me the next day... So the lads building the bike trails, fucking testing them out at night time, middle of the night. I was starting to weather, the cold. I was there, never done any biking around, so I knew nothing about it. And then you came over to me one day and you started telling me about the trail, and we looked at the trails, and they were they were cool. Like, and there was a lot more work to them than we thought they were. We thought it was just a few lads with shovels, but there was a good bit to it. And then you said, Oh, you should come out with some night. I'll bring a bike. And we met in Kinney Castle, and there was you. Anthony, Scott, and Aiden, Aiden wasn't it? Yeah. I think he had Corona at that time before anyone knew, remember? <laughs> yeah, he was on his deathbed on that spin. <laughs> <laughs> but that's two years ago, isn't it? No, it's more. More, yeah. More, three. Is it? Three. Yeah, it is. It's that, that, yeah. And will um, be coming on three years yeah. now, I think. will be coming on years. Oh. Come on, whatever, like. <laughs> Share the you love. have to be careful with your terminologies with me. Look, the protein is good for your skin. So. Ah, stop. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Gary gets these bikes out and I just said, all right, geez, that looks cool. It was an electric bike, wasn't it? It was, yeah. Yeah. And I said, how much is that? And he told me this outrageous number. Oh, geez, it was an outrageous number for a bike. I was terrified getting up onto it. It's um, not outrageous now. Oh, here they are now. They've gone up a lot. Oh, a lot more. There's people spending 10 grand on but. E-bikes. Higher be, ones would be run up and up at 14, like. That wouldn't be something you'd do, Gary, now. No. no. <laughs> but anyway, we got up on the bikes and it was it was cool. I never did that like that before. And it wasn't long before I was going and bought my own bike and, yeah, it's great. But it's so interesting. When you find out about a side of people's lives that you never understood or seen, and now up the mountains there's such a wide range of trails and stuff, It's uh, you see them all the time. But how did you get into biking first, I suppose? You were a Galway man. Yeah. You were a Galway man as well. Yeah. Did you know each other before biking? No, but actually our parents used to play badminton with each other. Badminton? Yeah. Badminton, yeah. Up in the old, up at the, I the old tennis club. I want yeah. to say... Was it the tennis club or was it in the or... Gay. I don't know. But that is not socially acceptable. <laughs> 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 badminton. Yeah, just came across that one time. I was, I was talking to your mom about it and I was saying, oh. Your, your mother she, or your mother and your father? My mom and dad both played badminton with my Gary's mom. Yeah. Did the other dad play? Yeah, he did. Oh, okay. So your parents were playing doubles? Yeah. Ah. Uh, ah. Uh, ah. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> one love. <laughs> That's interesting. So how did you go from, what th- when did you leave school? Did you finish out school? Oh, I finished school. Did you go to college? No. no. I went to this college of life. <laughs> what did you do when you left school? What Basic. were you planning on doing? I was going to just kind of figure it out, for, you know, because 
there was, uh, I suppose when I left, when I finished school, I had this drive to ride bikes and I was big into it. And You, you were big a, into it while you were in school? Correct. BMXing or? Mountain bikes. I was probably one of the first in where I was living. Like there was feck all at it and I got to see it through magazines. Like, so when you're in school, you go to Eason's. That was the internet. Yeah. You start picking up magazines and looking through stuff and. Got you into mountain biking. Looked at what was happening abroad. America was the big place for it. It was. What year was this? Roughly. Was it? 91, 92. It was definitely pre internet. And, you know, you'd go home, you'd be inspired looking at stuff, and you'd be building up bikes and hacking them together just to get something to work. And Your own you, bikes? Yeah, and then you go after the wood and test it out and absolutely make bits of yourself. Did you just buy, <laughs> did you just buy old bikes? Yeah, I had to start that way because, you know, you didn't have money, so you were fixing up whatever you could get. Were you on your own? Yeah. And then I had one or two friends that got into it and we'd all ride together. Then we were finding out that mountain biking it was kind of cyclocross, moving into mountain biking was kind of starting with clubs. So we'd join up with clubs on spins and it took it took off from there. And then there was um, kind of leagues, small like leagues were happening around the country. And like this is way, like it's way back. I mean, it's frightening when you think back how many years it is, but there was a small community and it was good people in it. And kind of, we're starting to find our niche of kind of extreme cycling. Then that's where it started, where we got these bikes put together. We hiked up Crow Patrick and Back then then, rode down. With yeah. shit bikes? Oh, absolute bangers. I don't know how we made it down live, but we made it down. Just ones you've made yourselves? Yeah, stuff we put together and buying parts and bits. And then there was a shop, I remember in the north, that was before Chain Reaction Cycle started. What he was doing, he was getting orders together, bringing stuff in from America because we couldn't get it. And that's how we started getting the mountain bike parts that we wanted. So looking at that, then it was, I suppose, when I left school, I kind of got a ticket organized. I went to America to, to ride bikes. Really? That was your main focus? <laughs> you and many others? No, I was on my own. Just take it and go on to ride bikes? Yeah. That's, that's fucking crazy. <laughs> so what did you work your way you went to America and what did you do then just got a job just well I suppose it was my summer there and I did some work over the summer to save money and got that ticket to get over what were you working at just odd jobs I was painting railings and fixing up stuff I was a, I was handy at fixing stuff so I was I got loads of little odd jobs to do and that kept me going and then, um, <clears throat> I suppose that's kind of where working for yourself was instilled in me. If you need to get something done, you have to do it yourself. And that's the truth. So when you went over, where in America did you go? We went out to Long Island. And my father was out there and he was working away. So I kind of stayed with him. And then from there, I kind of had a target there. Of, I had to get to Mount Snow because I read about this place. And it was class. and So I basically got when the, this was a big world mountain bike race on. So all the, you know, all your heroes that you're seeing and on reading about were all stuff. there. I was like, I have to go and see this for myself. So got the Toyota Camry packed up, took a ferry over to Connecticut from the island, drove all the way up along the coast and brought my brother with me. He was only what, I'd say he was only 14. He was as mad to go biking as well. <laughs> so we got up there. We basically brought tents with us. Oh, why age were you? I'd say it was what... 19. 19, 14 year old heading across America on their own. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good to me. <laughs> Sounds like a plan to look at mountain bikes. Yeah. Right, go on. So we got up there, we found a place, pitched a tent. So we had our allowance for a bit of food, got what we needed and just got, walked the mountain, seen stuff, met one of the lads from Dublin up in the mountain, which was mad because they were racing there. Um hmm. You can't go anywhere without running into an Irish that somewhere that I can. No, he no. can't. No, everywhere. But no, it was it was great, and I think the uh, the big thing for me at that event was uh, just to go. I suppose say how small the world is. Is um, my father had met this guy when he was doing a bit of work in Manhattan, and you just meet him at the bar. His name was Benny, uh, Benny Jovi, and on the phone he was kind of. He mentioned to me there, I met this guy, Benny, and his daughter does mountain biking. And then I clicked as like Missy Jovi is like she was number one in the world. Mount Downhill. 
like serious pilot on a bike. When you say downhill? Fastest time down the mountain on a set course. Right. A dead straight or any way Oh, just whatever co- markings are on the course, you have to follow the tape. Okay. There's no laps. You just start at the top and fly down to the bottom. And Pick whoever gets one. down the fastest wins. Right. Sounds simple. I know it ain't. Go on. No. But anyway, <laughs> just he goes to me, he goes, oh, I met this guy and this is the name. And I was like, wow. I said, talk about a small world. But like, he goes, well, I can arrange. He said, if you're going up to Mount Snow, and she'll meet. You know, she'll meet you there. I'll give him a heads up. And sure enough, he must have been talking to her anyway. I got up. They were at the Volvo Cannondale team. So myself and the brother got the whole VIP treatment around Volvo Cannondale and got up there. If he, fa- if he fell, he'd fall up, wouldn't he? Mm. And uh, we made great connections from there. And I think over the next few years, all these people that would have been riding bikes that we got to meet on the circuit, you know, I think, you know, they're always there and they'll always help you out. Like people are very good when you're in a co- small community of a, a niche sport like motocross. Everyone knows each other and everyone gets on very well. You know, and they, their door is always open. So that even instilled it more in you. Yeah. And when you went away from there, you were even more focused. Oh, on I was it. driven to do that whole league. So what did you do then? Train. And what did that entail? Just mountain biking every time yeah. you got a chance. Just get out on the bike and ride. On ship bikes. Oh no, I, oh, no I, I invested in, like I just worked, I seen a bike in a shop and I was, I, it was something I wanted. So I just started paying off, going in, throw a few pounds on it. Just get the money together and keep chipping away at it and got the bike I needed to do what I had to do. So how long did it take you to get from there to I'm entering competitions now? Came home, did a load of riding at home, had to work back. Just, I went working with a builder here in Galway. I just tried to save some money for that and then just worked away and then got a ticket back out to America. Did a bit more biking, came back home, did a bit more work, then flew out and then just kind of got myself established and then just booked a series out of races to go do. How did you do? Um? I did actually pretty good. <laughs> but, um, you know, I wasn't, uh, I didn't finish last anyway, so it was good. <laughs> How many injuries? Actually, I fluked it. I did very well without ending up in hospital. So it was all downhill racing I did. So How long did you do that before you said, oh, I need way more horsepower? I was always messing around with mot- motorbikes trying to fix up stuff. But I think that started, I'd say, my late 20s. So, you know, when you're working a bit more, you're getting a bit more money together. So I got big into the motocross then. Again, that was most weekends you had to be on the bike to stay bike fit, you know. So you had to find out who had land to go ride on and practice and stuff like that. And then just start entering the championship. But like, it doesn't matter what you're doing, whether it's mountain bike, motocross, it's the same work ethic and training. You know, if you don't train properly and you have to be, you have to train, you have to be fitter above what you need to be because you have to be able to deal with a bad injury. Is the motocross expensive? Yeah. To get into? Very. How many bikes did you go through? I didn't go through a lot. I think what I had, I minded and was able to fix. I think that's the big thing, being able to fix your own stuff. What was your yeah. best bike? Uh, best bike, RMZ 450. You still have that, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, Gary, look, there's one behind you. Gary, yeah, Gary's like a, he's like a magpie, isn't he? <laughs> Yeah, Anton Shiny, like. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And he has to just, you, you get hard to let go of stuff, don't you? Just keep it. Keep and you get good memories with them. Yeah, yeah. Did you do motocross over in the US? No. Just in. No, but I got a chance to ride one or two tracks over there. Um, there was a guy, Jeff Rogers. He used to, he was an ex pro. Um, he had a bad injury. He was in actually a tree surgeon. Boom. Boom truck broke and he collapsed in the bucket and broke all his back and legs the whole so lot. So it wasn't so. even the bike that done him. No. Oh. And he was a serious pilot. That's sickening. Very like but he's back at it. He's riding bikes again. Um a few rods holding them together, but he's still able to do it. But again, he he had a little place out the back. He said I was able to work a machine, he said, You want to build a course there for yourself, you can use one of my bikes. I was cool. like, Sound, I'll go at that then. <laughs> and how long did you do motocross for before you were you gave it up or, or may well, gave it up? No, I, d- I didn't give it up as such. I just wanted to get back mountain biking. 
It's it's time. I wasn't you can only have time for were one race. Were you afraid other. of getting killed? <laughs> well, there was a bit of that. I nearly got, got killed at one race, and that kind of gave me a bit of a rethink. But then, sure, I'm just as bad on a bicycle. I think it's very <laughs> funny. I now that I do a bit of mountain biking, and you be talking to people on the mountain. So many of them. Oh, I used to do motocross. All right, why are you doing this now? Oh, I got badly injured. <laughs> My wife won't let me. More machine than man, full of pins and bolts yeah. and rods. And when I all, they all have one thing in common. Um, fucking batshit crazy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, they're on the mountain bike. And I would love to ring their wives and say, you think this is any safer? Like, this lad's a crazy person. Mm. Crazy. What? You're a bit crazy on the bike. I think, well, I wouldn't call it control craziness. He's fast. It's fast. He's able to go fast. That's the difference. There's some lads that just hang on for dear life and know, if they make it down they're fucking lucky. Even but when he's going slow, when I go mountain biking with you and you're going nice and easy you can't help but kick it out and go places you're not supposed to go. Like the track is here there's a big wide wall here you have to go on the wall. <laughs> he has to be on the wall. I mean if it's there like. If it's there you might as well use yeah, it. Yeah I use it. See I'm not built like that. I try to preserve my safety at all times. I don't have enough balls for it. But um, no, the motocross, uh, what the motocross did for me, I think, with biking was it helped me understand how to hold speed and commitment. Like there's a certain amount of commitment on the mountain bike, but the commitment on the motorbike is at a next level. Like it's the speed, the weight of the bike behind you. There's so much that can go wrong and absolutely break you. Where in a mountain bike, you have that window to get escape. Wow. And when, when did you come home from America altogether? Just and say, right, I'm going to start doing stuff here now. And... Uh, 1999. 98, 99 was Christmas time. How many years had you done out there? I was going back and forth from there probably over five years. What was your favourite car out there? Huh? You, you were I in... had a Cadillac. Did you like that? I loved it. Coupe de Ville, two door. Boot. I think you could put five bodies in the boot. <laughs> <laughs> We'll say no more on that. <laughs> Did you ever have to put my body in the boot? No, but I was measuring it out because I was fascinated about watching mob films. You just throw your man in the boot and go, you know. How many um, mountains and places that people would know did you ride out in the US? I've done What's that place? Breckenridge, Colorado, uh, Utah. I was in Mormon land. You chatting to any of them? I probably was, I just didn't know. Then um, uh, California, Big Bear, Big Bear Lake, California. Where's Whistler? Is that Canada? Uh, did Whistler? Yeah, Whistler. I rode in Whistler a few years ago. The BC bike race. BC bike race was a torturous event. That was the torturous. Seven day mountain bike marathon. Talk about talk about that for a minute. What was the that chicken. Like? The which? The chicken. Wasn't it your man who had a megaphone and a chicken or something? Oh yeah, to, to wake, wake you up. up yeah. yeah. So it was a stage race. You had to camp. They set up camp after every stage. You had a tent and then you had, so you had to ride a section of mountain every day. It was all around British Columbia. Were you on your own? No, I went over with um, three friends, Connor, Orla and Andy. Um, but we must have put about a year of training into that event. Uh, that was probably one of the hardest things I've done. Did you train here? Yeah. And then flew out there? Yeah. With the bike? Yeah. And then Correct. just go? Yeah. So did a couple of days to get climatized over there, get adjusted to the time, get used to the weather and then... Prep for the race. Was it hot? It was hot enough for a couple of days, yeah. Um, Did the altitude catch you out? Yeah. Because you're that, they're a lot higher there than we are here, like. Yeah, you have to pace yourself once you're going into the altitude. You have to look at where you... Well, you have to look at your strengths. What altitude strength. is it? I couldn't tell you. Now, I know that where BC kind of starts at sea level anyway. If mm. you like, head straight up, it just spikes up at Whistler. But we were riding... It was well done, because at the start... The, the first stages of the mountain bike races were close to sea level and gradually brought you up the mountain. They didn't just send you up to the highest spot. You got up there gradually on the seventh day. How many, how many miles is it? We we're doing probably between, oh, that doesn't sound a lot, but like say between, in kilometers, I think we we're doing something between 35 and 65, 70 a day. Is that on the mountain? Yeah. Mountain bikes? Yeah. So it's not a race or it's... No, no, this is proper mountain biking, like in some serious, like we had on one day, I remember we were climbing for about 13 kilometers 
and stone up. and rock. And Everything crap. just roads and fire service roads are really steep there as well for the trucks, the logging roads. And then got to the top and then it was lovely enough because it was about like seven or eight kilometre descent then going back down. And you were timed on, there was a separate timing for racing on descents. So, oh, so you were racing downhill as well? As well race? as up. So I think overall I finished 35th downhill. And overall in the event about, I think it was 89th place out of 500. That's not bad. You so don't know, right? Time, yeah, so. Did you ever do that, Con? Nothing that big, no. Only just a local kind of cross country kind of mountain bike races and a couple of events, but nothing, nothing crazy like that. Would you like to? I don't think I'd be able to. I don't think I'd have. Yeah, like it takes, like you'd be training for the year to do it. But sure, I've I've kids and all that kind of stuff. Carry on, like you can't be. Messing Gary's not Gary's not tied down. And he's a lone ranger. But you see, I try go mountain biking with the kids and everything, like so they yeah. love cycling. Well, the I'm older one's grown out of it now. She's kind of losing interest in it, but sure, she's as good as a teenager. She just turned 12, like so. Oh, yeah. I'm going to have to get a mountain bike for Clark because I think that it's going to be very hard for me now to head up the mountain and go cycling without bringing him. I oh, know. I think he'd be a flyer. Yeah, well, he's, if he's as mad as he was in the BMX, I could be in trouble. So when you came home and you started doing the motocross, what were you working at when you were doing that? I was just, just building. Building, yeah. Just general construction between machinery and you know, roofing and stuff. I, I kind of was a good all-rounder at work. And when did you stop the biking altogether? The mountain bike, or not the mountain biking, the motocross? I said I packed in the motocross in 2010. And then full-time mountain biking? Yeah. And then you started your own shop? Yeah, just kind of got into that. While you were still building? Yeah, kind of, when the, as I say, we had the, the crash there, so we kind of wound down the... Just wound down the work because it was just it wasn't worth going near it and i had this thing i wanted to get into the bike trade i knew so many people at it you know from racing back in the day that ended up taking a career in it i was, I was more curious than anything else just to see what the industry was like oh, well, what, didn't, when you were deciding to start doing the bike trails you were already building little trails around so you'd all while you, you were in that out, sort of... yeah so just to get at it like there was an opportunity there where they were looking, wheelchair were looking for people that had construction background, yeah. but had to be a mountain biker. Naturally enough. And be able to drive machines and have all the tickets. So I have all the tickets. I collect, I kept all my paperwork up to date. So I was just a prime candidate there. So, And you had Graham's, a bike shop as well? <clears throat> yeah. yeah. So with Graham, Graham kind of got that gig together and just asked me then, would I, would I go in? To go and I, would I just help him out just to get get going and stuff like that and Scott jumped on board as well and I think that I suppose we came a good trio then at it like because we all have our you know we all have our good skill sets to apply to it and we can all ride bikes was so. the sleeve bloom one the first one you done it was yeah and just for everyone listening like how much have you completed up there and what have you done and so we took on so the job had was started with a previous contractor so we kind of had to go back in and tidy up just rectify a few bits and pieces and just to get it riding right and then those new phases put together and that was all priced up and we just took on that work how many kilometers is up there now i think right i think riding at the moment it's hard to put a number because there's as i say different people working on it but i'd say for a bike ride up there now you have a good 70k spin up there because that's a lot isn't it that's if you do both counties. Yeah, Leash and... And off, yeah. yeah. But it's the one project. Mm. Still the same spot. Like same mountain. Just like a, the few times I've never gone, I've never crossed over to the other side, but I've gone from Kennedy Castle a few times. And if you do the outer loop, follow the right trail and go all the way around the outside, I think it's 30k or something like that. Yeah. But you're out for a few hours, like. Oh, so. yeah. Yeah. I like them. I like them both. I preferred the Kennedy side, but there's one, one or two loops after opening up in the Boreen side, Bore side now, and they're nice. But I wouldn't be able to do the whole lot, the two sides together. I wouldn't have the legs. Well, that's a two day event. Yeah, uh, that's a two day event for me. That's a two day event for me. But it's great. It's great to see the mountains being used. Kind of, I like to say for the recreation side because for so many years you had to go abroad for that. Mm. You know, you had nothing on your doorstep to do. And it wasn't you like you need something that's going to that you can spend hours at. Like, mm. 
Mm. You know, you don't want to be able to just go out for an hour and that's it because that's all there is. Especially if you're going to travel from a different county, Correct. you want to make the most of it. Yeah, for every hour in the car, you want to be getting it on the bike. So if you're going three hours in a car, you want to have at least three hours of biking. And it's a big industry in Ireland now, isn't it? That's huge. Like it's like the mountain is packed now with bikes every weekend now. It's an awful pity creature from our point of view. They've done such good work on the bike trails and stuff. If you just put in some car parks and people to park stuff, <laughs> it'd be just awesome. And if you're on a mountain bike and you see our machines, could you jazz the shoulders yourselves before you walk beside them? Before we kill you. <laughs> don't get crushed. <laughs> Unloading a load of timber, next thing there's a lad there. Oh yeah. You pat, walking right beside the machine. So you, you, why didn't, have you not got eyes on the back of your head like? No, no. I'm genetically there, not there yet. <laughs> oh, but sure, Scott, 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 like the odd time, he'd be like, you think that there's a trail being dug? Like, you know, and here's Scott and he's working away and he's cutting it out nice and Next thing you use a bicycle behind them. Oh, people are so stupid. Mm. People are so stupid. <laughs> How did you get into? You had on your in your bike shop. You had a bike BMX place and everything. Oh yeah, with a bowl. Um, yeah, it was a project. I think that kind of spurred off from. We did an event called Air in the Square. Do you remember that, Colin? Yeah. Shut down a shopping center and ran this urban downhill race through it. That was cool. Chopped the handrails off and everything off when the, there was like a, there was one section where you're in the upper floor and you can look down onto the lower section below you. Yeah. And. Uh, this is in Air Square. In Air Square Shopping Centre. So, what is it? You went up, you went in there one day and just chopped the handrail off so the lads could hop on the bike and drop off. Drop two floors. From two floors down onto a big huge ramp. Really? So, and you had a big bag. Big yeah, airbag. And we set that up. So, when we saw... I suppose it was such an interest for urban sports on the bike. And we're looking at skate parks and there's nothing out there. So we kind of got the idea to say, to put a warehouse together. So we just did something temporary, got some, the ramps that were left over from that event, set them up and then did the, opened it up what, once a week, wasn't it Fridays? Yeah, Scott pretty much managed it. He was out there, yeah. he'd go out and open and he could be the collecting them. The, no, no, oh, out, out, out in the, the warehouse. So we where the bike the shop stuff. is now, that it, what has turned into, it was just an empty warehouse, double wide unit. And, uh, yeah, we just had all the old ramps from the big air in the square thing. Yeah. And Scott would open up once or twice a week and you would all just go out in the evening and just ride ramp, ride the bikes around them and the ramps. And then so they but surely one half of it got built with the, the new ramps and the other side was the old stuff. I can't get it. It's so cool. But yeah, and so it just evolved. It evolved from that and it got busy and then we're Are like, right. Are there any pictures of it? Uh, I'd be able to find some, yeah. Get yeah. some pictures. Because it's just, you know, I, I was shocked and you couldn't do it because of oh, insurance and all that stuff. Yeah, in the end. So we ran that as a community, like it was a community project. It was a club and the whole thing was club based. It was a non-profit. It was just, just somewhere having a run. Somewhere for people to go. Somewhere for fun. people to go and have fun. And it worked. And that was BMX specific, wasn't it? It or was, but we allowed skateboards and, and scooters because you can, you know, let everyone in and have a bit of fun. So and this, that's the old Instagram page there. So, like that was Who some of the events. Who brought the motorbike in? Uh, that, one of the young lads. What was his name? Jack. Jack. Yeah. Yeah. Jack. <laughs> he, he, yeah. The, the other lad was riding motorbikes. So, when he got into is the motorbike, that you, Gary? Is that you doing loop loop? That's Scott, Scott doing the backflips. I think. Yeah. Of course it is. And then there's some of the events. Like and there was, it was big. Like, and then you you went over to Scotland there as well. Yeah. In one of them. Just a bit of research work. I bet it was. Hang on, is no there a drink bit? involved whatsoever? No. Is there even a bit of a clip here? Who's doing a backflip? I don't know who that is. That looks like Jack. Who's who's doing oh, that? That's looks Quinner. Like a creep. <laughs> yeah, Quinner. That's Quinner. <laughs> Doesn't look like a creep brand. <laughs> he, he'd give anybody a run for his money. I bet he would. And he's just Here's one the of the young lads now starting. Yeah. Like that was a daunting drop. These yeah. are just you know they they get their stuff. That's that looks. That's Jack when he was yeah. younger. Like they were just you know riding around in the bowl and getting good but they'd be out there like every feckin weekend and, and they'd be getting better and better and better and it's crazy what they'd be doing on it like that's mad and you built all that yourself yep that's that's Scott good on the trials Scott. bike on his trials bike said it was BMX <laughs> just <laughs> bang out a backflip there yeah no bother like so I had a guy working with me um, uh, Vinnie Sullivan serious carpenter so working out the curves there is so much that bowl is like building a boat Backwards. Of course, yeah. And 
like and when you're building a bowl like that it has to be strong enough that if you put a tarp in it you could fill it with water it won't break well there's the bowl the you, the, you, see the, you see the detail in the corners yeah it's like a jigsaw piece like so that's that's from where the sit- seating area was and then that was up on top of the big quarter pipe so you could see the rest of it so there was that box jump on the left and you had the deck so it had to be jumping out of the bowl up above onto the deck where the MBW sign is the black sign in the in the top right or top left do you remember the bust ups Fergus would have breaking bikes and everything in oh yeah he, he was just too big for bikes like he was a big hefty lad like just there's pure there's the bag pure muscle there's the airbag yeah, yeah. do you still have it yeah so you Will yeah pop that's, it up. do you want to have a go on I'd, I'd love to just jump off a roof on it we can arrange that well, look at the height of that that's that could ju- be Scott as well we like, jumped you know. off that warehouse roof into it and hurt. you put me up on the teleporter well, once. The as teleporter well. at full height and we were jumping out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was I was up on top of the teleporter, like I was getting photos. And instead of waiting for him to come, I like he put me on like, he put a pallet on the teleporter and lifted me up. And I was up there taking photos of the lads up in the air. And it was easier for me to just jump jump off onto the bag than wait for him to come down, start up the teleporter and bring me back down again. Like Fucking hell. So that you had to stop that anyway, insurance and stuff like that. Insurance call us, yeah. And we'd no claims. That's mad. That's what I mean about this country. Like, people try to do something that is actually fun and could help their community and stuff, and it gets stopped or stupid shit like that. Like, even the airbag, that could be a business in itself. But insurance completely capped that. Like, you could do team building stuff, you could set up a tower and just do free jumping. And it's all about, like, God, I'd love that. Me and Greg and Gary just push each other off a building. Yeah. Fuck you! <laughs> like we could, you know, we could set up like stunt scenes. <laughs> yeah. Like we'll do like a movie. Watch me now, and I'm gonna do it. You know, like your John Clan Van Damme. You could do part two. He could be scrapping on a roof and then throw one lad off. Yeah, that'd be fucking something. I know a few people that love to throw off a fucking roof. It's one of those fights that, like, you know, the way we were talking on the last podcast. Like Greg was coaching you, was it? And Barry yeah. was coaching Garrett. Mm. So we could do version two, but at heights. I wouldn't, I'd injure myself just looking at something like that now. You, you just jump, put your legs out front and land on your back. Like. I'd land them in neck. <laughs> <laughs> David Cuddy in a wheelchair for the rest of his life. Because of Gary Daveron. No, I just turn down the air pressure in the bag so it yeah. engulfs you. There's all these flaps on the side. So it, it, the, <laughs> <laughs> I know what you, you, you open it. the flaps he's and then the air comes on out. This and he's <laughs> coming on that. There's flaps here, there's flaps there. <laughs> but yeah, you can control how hard or how soft it is. With the Hard and soft. <laughs> yeah. It never ends it. Just unbelievable. So what like if you're if you were doing tricks and the whole point of the airbag is so like you can land on it and you won't wreck yourself because it's soft. But if if you're getting better at landing the tricks and you can close to it, you increase the air pressure in it. So that when you land on it, you can still roll on the bike. Oh. Or if you're just starting off, you can make it softer. So that second you hit it, you sink down into it. But it means you've a softer landing, but you can't really roll away. So you can mess with it. It must wrap up fairly small. Where is it? Um, I was just left out in storage at the moment, but it's um, it'll fit on a pallet. Like I said, a double pallet is what it takes. Fold it properly. No, it, it's a bit... What do you pump it up with? The big fans run it. There's three fans that you plug in. Like um, a bouncy castle. Like a oh. bouncy castle. You still have the fans? Yeah. That's not new don't fucking have. Do you ever see how many tools he has? Oh, I know, yeah. Like a, like a magpie. I've never seen as many people and person with as many tools. Yeah, but I use them all. I know you use more. They're for the but different phases of work I'm going to do. There's stuff <laughs> that you have that you have never used. No. 100% no. there's stuff he has that he's never used. No, I use everything. Uh, Gary, I come do. on now. <laughs> he might have only used it once, but he used yeah, it. I used it. <laughs> <laughs> so, how did you get into... You love your diggity dig 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 digs. Gary loves his diggity dig 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 diggers. Mm. If, I, yeah, if I be truthful now, I think that was my number one hobby. The... Um, father being a quarry fitter and just talking about the stuff he's working on and I think when I was old enough he, he brought me to he'd bring me to a quarry on a Saturday yeah and then you get to go around in the load and shovel and the dump trucks and all this and it was all like back then it, like I was what probably 10 or 11 something like that but that that was just a huge world and it's just, it were was you, good like when you were 10 or 11 were you the same height as you are now or did you no, get no bigger? no I, was, I think about an inch smaller <laughs> 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 but um diggers yeah. yeah what what diggers have you had diggers I, 
that many. I had it's a kind of like your tools. You've shown me pictures and you've had diggers that were way overkill for work that you'd be doing. I had a, twen- yeah, I had a 21 ton Samsung. That was basically the version that had trans that had changed over to Volvo. So I had one of them for a couple of years. And that was basically just for digging out sites that we were doing our own foundations on. It was a handy machine for lifting pans for concrete and all that stuff. So you could go in, get the work done with it, clear the sites back. And then with small tree ton for running around, tidying up and small extension work. Then teleporter was the other machine we had. Um, and that was basically it. Now you're you have your little bobcat. Yeah. You love that yoke. Oh, the dinger. And you're into your what's it called? The Encon. Keep, Encon. Keep forgetting that name. You'd oh, be quicker get, learning how to game. fly a fucking space shuttle then. Uh, Colin hopped in the last day and I think you were a bit bamboozled with I the was controls. Yeah, like there's, there's, oh, feel the, there's the roll wheels on the back and then there's the triggers on the back and then there's buttons at the top and roll the wheels for, on the top and you go forward, back, left digs. and right. And, for diggity dig dig men, right? They're the Rolls Royce. They all love their it's class, like. That's if they have the, I suppose the brains to use them. No, there is, a, it's a different way of digging. And I asked someone, I asked people on the way down for questions and I actually got a couple of times people saying, are you buying another end gun? And if so, are you putting it on a real machine? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm going to stay with the toy versions for now. <laughs> the, but the thing you have is perfect for what you're. Yeah, at. but you can do a lot of work. I mean, you don't need a massive machine if you know how to work the machines properly. Just like, you know, that's at the limit for towing and everything. I could go off now and get a six ton and it'd be a bit of handier but then you have to get you're kind of at the mercy of someone else to move it for you otherwise you have to have that equipment you can buy yourself. a six ton in another way huh you can buy a bigger one in another way no we'll go there now <laughs> <laughs> you um i couldn't get over how much work that little machine done around the yard the brush and the, the yeah. claw on it and it done everything that yeah, one i love it machine. for building walls yeah you do enough not walls show, show us a picture of the walls he, does with the little he building it with the like picking it up and bit by bit like the Lego. There's a guy on Instagram you show me him. Wall, wall structures, is it? Oh, rock structures. Rock structures. Yeah. yeah, he's in the US. Yeah, he does that kind of stuff all the time. Yeah, and advanced wall structures as well. They're really good. But with big machines. Yeah, they're using like twenty five tons and stuff like that. Yeah. There's who's that? That's out one of the the lads' back gardens. Yeah, so I had to make it look like it was a hundred years old plus. And that is. Uh, and you that's only new there yeah that's all new so well, made look old How last summer just gone um sorry last summer wasn't it you did that uh, one last winter oh winter there's another wall yeah. you put together yeah and where do you find all them stones in the ground so you dig the ground find the stones pick them up there was some old walls but a lot of stuff like the stuff with the moss on it now would have been kind of just sitting like rubbled walls then you get a lot more see the dirtier stones like that would have been in the ground like in the west of Ireland, especially for anyone that coast, is listening granite. to this on Spotify, if you want to see what we're looking at, you're gonna have to go on YouTube and look. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's just showing the pictures of the stuff that he's after doing. Uh, the walls is something that my father had. You see, he grew up in a farm, I suppose, and you know, like if you wanted to get anything out of a field, you had to pick up the stones and throw them onto a wall. That's where you put the stones. Hence the land Galloway. is so bad. Every time you look, there's stones to, everywhere. To put you away from the walls for a second, that's what the bow looks like when it was being built. <laughs> it does look like a bow. And there was two there, wasn't there? Two, two there's, there's a ply. ply. Yeah, the ply's crossed, so it doesn't split. Who's there building it with you? It's myself, Vinny. I don't know who else is looking in there. I wasn't there for the bowl. I helped you build the jump box that and the vert like wall someone. and everything else, but when the bowl was being built, I wasn't around. I don't know where I was. I'm on the left, oh, yeah. Vinny's on, on the right, huh? and I think sitting on my thumb. <laughs> <laughs> I was saying I'm on the left, and Vinny's on the right, and I suppose whoever's in the middle is telling us what to do. Fucking prick, <laughs> telling you what to do. I wouldn't think there's too many people telling you what to do. Sure, learn every day. <laughs> and when you um, back to the bike trails, um, where are you doing it now? Oh, uh, we've we're down in Balehora, giving it a bit of a a revamp. You don't do an awful lot of it yourself now, you're too busy. Huh? You're too busy digging, digging, digging. No, no, we're in there the whole time. I'll do my share. And what do you think the crack is with mountain biking now? Well, it's turned into a mainstream sport here. It is big now. I think we have a lot of, um, a lot of people that are new to it, starting later in life. 
um, getting into it. So as bikes being sold, there's more money being spent on it now because, of, you know, there's a lot of working people getting into it now. You know, as a sport, when it started, it was more niche and it was very small and you were kind of really into it to get it going. So it's it's just gone mainstream now. And obviously the need for facilities is big because people... A lot of people mountain biking have taken it up more on a safety side just to get off the main road as well. Like you have a lot of people that just they're going to ride at a beginner level and they're happy out with that. And that's they just want to get out and ride safe. And trails are being built as a dual purpose now. Like they're safe enough for a beginner to get out and enjoy them. That's why I got rid of my racer and just got a mountain bike. It was safer. Yeah. When I was on the, the road bike, I always thought someone was going to knock me down. It's, yeah. it's scary like. Like whenever I, if I'm on, <clears throat> I've, I've a set of road wheels for the gravel bike. So if I'm ever out on the road, I will avoid any main roads like the plague. I just meander and disappear off down back roads and go for a wander. He said meander. Yeah. Oh. Meander. Yeah, big words. What would you say to people that say, <laughs> <laughs> what would you say to people that say real men ride women, not bikes? That's me. Sorry. What is that? It's the, the, the rock rock rock. Rock. I did it like this, like Second. rocking. Yeah, don't rock. What would you say to people that say that? What? Oh, we get real men. Ride women, not bikes. I don't know. I think real men ride men like. <laughs> like that. Th those guys fuck dudes. <laughs> they do. <laughs> no, that takes a bit of balls. <laughs> the bike shop thing. What's it like having a bike shop? No, I suppose mad. the first thing I should ask is how, how the fuck did you think of just opening a bike shop? Um, we start When we started, we were looking at the whole shop idea. It was... Um, like when I was kind of looking at the development plan for cycling and greenways was a big thing coming up. And this is back in like Mayo Greenway was just done, was getting put together. That was 2008. And Darura was built, the mountain bike trail. And there was a lot of people just heading out biking. And I could see it myself. I think I was looking at it. I wanted a change. I wanted to get into it. I wanted to see what the industry was like. It was something that I always wanted to do because I worked in bike shops growing up. You know, I like, because it was a hobby. And um, when you were in Ireland, where were you buying your bikes when you wanted them? I was getting them, I was getting them locally, like, but I'd have to special order what I was trying to get in, you know. And again, for what I was getting back to, ringing the guys in the north, trying to get parts in. You're buying secondhand stuff, you know, off lads that had got bikes in. But I was working in a bike shop, to helping out, because I just wanted to be able to get stuff. And that was my way to do it, was working and learn just learn a bit more about bikes. There was some good guys at the time in Galway. So I got in with, I remember working with Mickey Welsh, got in, there was a great guy working there, Kenneth, he could fix anything. You know, and just did some part-time work. And then I used to hang out there after school for maybe an hour as well. Because was, it wasn't too far away from the school where I was and then go home. So I suppose I had worked and seen the shop scene. So I kind of had an understanding of what I had to be done. But it was back to getting back into cycling. And I was trying to get stuff and I was like, there isn't anyone specializing in mountain bike stuff properly that knows what you need. And what they're doing. And what they're doing. So I kind of looked at that and that's kind of how it got it kicked off. And that snowballed from there then. And why did you go for, you specialized in Kona bikes? Yeah, Kona started later, I think 2011, started working in with Kona. You traveled all over with them, didn't you? Yeah. Did a lot of stuff, did a lot of video work with them as well. You done video stuff for product development in Ireland and stuff yeah. as well, didn't you? For different companies. Yeah. That between that and the product development team, we we're getting to test new bikes and getting to launch bikes. Like we launched the gravel bike here in Ireland, so there was a video done on that, and that was kind of done in Clare, Galway, and Mayo. I picked all these alternative routes to ride and showcase what Ireland had to offer. So Mayo Tourism took on content from that as well. And that was a good video. And then we did one in the Alps uh, for the Precept, one of the mountain bikes that they were launching. So we did a two-day video there. And Kona do this thing where they give people little prizes for dream bills. Dream bills, yeah. Yeah. How many of them have you got? A good few. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you get a little patch. <laughs> I have one. I have a patch. You yeah. got me one because... Yeah, well, I, well your, your bike is a dream build. It is, yeah. Yeah. I was very proud of that, even though I didn't have any input into it. You did it. <laughs> I said, do you want a dream bike? And he goes, yeah, well, I'll, I'll, get the dream, I'll get the dream ready. Yeah, and I got it. I was delighted. I have that patch. I just have to figure out where I'm going to put it. You have yeah. a couple of epic bikes. Yeah. 
You've done titanium ones. Very good. I love titanium bikes. And it's just raw. Raw industrial looking bikes is the way to go. Really? Plain. For you? Yeah. That even has Wi Fi gears. Bluetooth. Bluetooth. I think they're Bluetooth, yeah. Yeah. Or Ant Plus, ANT Plus. They talk to each other anyway. Yeah, wireless, wireless gears. Yeah. That's mad. That's mad. Are you capped on a small bit of tech? And how how much would that be? It's a lot, anyway. Oh, not going to put a number. And <laughs> he, <laughs> I don't put a number. He'd get up on when he'd be riding his shit out of it. Um, um, another question I got asked: uh, When you're mountain biking, click pedals or normal ones? Oh, I think there's a fifty-fifty in the camp on that. I love to be clipped in and locked into the bike, but some people you can't. Took me a long time to work up to being clipped in. Um, I just didn't like the thought of being locked onto the bike because I wasn't good enough. I just panic. But I remember the very first day I rode on the gravel bike. I went off for a spin around on the road and I was clipped in. And just at the end of the house, there's a roundabout. So I would cycle down to the roundabout just to cross over to the other side of the road. So I'm on the right side of the road to head off. Mm. And uh, I forgot I was clipped in. So I just came to a roll to a stop and then panicked because I couldn't move my feet. And I w- thankfully, I didn't fall. I was I was just able enough to kind of turn the handlebar and kind of cycle off up the cycle lane in the wrong direction until I could remember that I had to clip out. Yourself. But yeah, like there's, you'd see so many people that just when they very first time they clipped in and they forget and they literally just key though. Happened me. That's so embarrassing. And it happened to me at one, one point as well, actually, um, off up around the back road. There's a car coming up behind me. So I, it was on a tight, tight, tight road and I was climbing up around like these. It, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> and I heard a car coming behind me So I pulled in out of the way Because I was only crawling up this hill Dying um, So he passed me right And I was grand like, So I hopped onto the bike And foolishly Before getting going properly Getting my speed up on the hill I clipped in And of course I, I was on a hill And I didn't have the power to get going So just uh, Clipped in And I barely moved And clipped the other foot in And just keeled over sideways uh, like, And just went I, I was all bruised down the side of me down the leg because like you can't do anything you don't put your hand down you just panic yeah. and just smash into the ground at me first time ever on my road bike and it didn't even have clips it was them little the straps. straps the straps oh, death worse. straps and I put the straps yeah. on and I cycled around my house when I was living in Mount Tra, down to the junction and there was a red light <laughs> never thought of it and then I went to take my foot off and as slow as that and straight down right on my elbow Mm-hmm. And for three weeks, I was driving the machine, wrapping rags around my elbow. I've broke up. And yeah. I never used them after that. I was terrified. And even when I'm on the mountain bike now, you know the parts I hit? You know the stones that yeah. you put? What do you call them? Oh, rock pitching. They're so annoying. Jump them. I, I can't. I don't have the facilities. Go faster. I can't. <laughs> and they, they throw me off the bike. We can't all be Scott like. And I asked for a little... Um, I wanted to carry stuff. Oh, yeah, the stuff you sent me. Oh yeah, the the frame bag. The frame bag. I got the frame. I've bag. never seen anybody trust was... a zip on a bag as much as you did when uh, you put the fucking uh, frame bag <laughs> upside down, <laughs> and then like you put your phone, your keys, and then the bag is there, and you zip it up. And if the zip rattled open, there goes your keys and I your phone and everything. That's like. was for. I didn't know I went the other way. But that what was it called? The oak in the back of the sea. Well, the seat saddle bag. bag goes on the back of the seat, but then on the frame there's a top loader. That yeah. Well, the called. saddle bag fell off. Right. And it locked my wheel. Oh, it fell into and the I wheels. Was, yeah. I was going as fast as I could down this. <laughs> and the next thing was like pulling the handbrake. I nearly shit myself. I nearly shit myself. And I had the, you let me use that electric bike for the first month or two that yeah. I was cycling with you. And when I got my new bike, do you remember? And he said it to me. He said it to me before I went on. He goes, that's way lighter. Take it handy on the little jumps. <laughs> 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 it's way lighter. And down this hill I went. And what did you call it? Dead sailor. Yeah. I dead sailored straight into a tree. <laughs> this, straight into a tree. All here. I was black and blue. It was, And ever since then, I have been really cautious on the bike. What's a dead sailor? You, you go just off take the off in the air and that's it. You freeze. You're gone. You freeze. Straight into a tree. You don't eat. Oh, yeah. Okay. I got you. It, I never knew it was called dead sailor. Just, yeah. Dead sailor. Dead just ragdoll. Rag no, no, it was a sudden stop. Right again, the tree. And I got some bang. That be- opened my eyes. It's better than doing a scorpion. Thank God I had my helmet and everything. Like, I mean, I was, I would have been broke up and shy. Mm. Only I'm so fucking hardy. 
<laughs> like any other man now it would have been a helicopter having to come from that would have been a Dublin that would have yeah straight to Dublin yeah the helicopter would have come from Adlone try watch Gary dislocate his shoulder once that was great crack and then we put it back in yeah we put ah, it back but in you again. do you, you're <laughs> mental I had to put it in because I had to drive back yeah so, yeah you, you you overshot a jump when when you're cycling around you, you're yourself. looking at things that no one would cycle and you're going will we go down there well, we will. We all go down. They all start getting erections, and they all start getting excited, <laughs> and they're putting the bikes on their back, and they're trying to climb up these dead fucking dead drops. Yeah, and down they go. Yeah, psyching each other, each other out. Yeah, like, come on, you can do it. And each one of them there, he's gonna kill himself. He's gonna kill himself. Yeah, but yeah, we're not too bad. Like we kind of know what we can and we can't do, so we're not gonna push your, push anybody into doing something that they're not comfortable with. But at the same time. If Gary knew that I'd be able, capable of doing something, he'd be like, "Ah, oh, you go on, do it. You'd be grand. No bother. You can yeah. do it. You can do no, it." No, no, I would draw the line and say yes and no, but because there is places, they are a one-way ticket. Like some rides we've done, you're on a one-way ticket trail. You, you have, start. You've you shown move. me a few now that if you make a mistake, you're dead. That is it. Like he, they're just going to pick your body one on up. his phone where it's like just drop, and there's one of them you, f- you fell. Yeah, you, that's where the clipped-in pedal saved my life, actually. Oh, up um, uh, the old miners' Muckish, trail yeah. in, Muckish. in Muckish Mountain up Mayo. Three hundred foot drop, and it just went. The bike kind of held you in place. Yeah. And nothing. Just I could just see nothing except yeah. If I'm down there, I'm, I'm, I'm not coming out of it. Had to would, climb Vicky, out of it. Vicky wouldn't let me do that. Not a fucking chance. She it's easier mad. to ask for forgiveness than it is to ask for permission. That's true. Just that's don't true. say anything. Yeah, that's true. I'm not going to get run over. He's going on the road. Yeah, that's true. But. You know, at least it wouldn't be your fault. <laughs> it's not like that you could blame someone else for that. How do you go home and say, oh, he fell off the mountain? What was he doing up there? What was he doing up there on a mountain bike? Did you ever cycle down Crow Patrick? Yeah, a few times. Is that allowed? No, that was a long time ago. Did you say a prayer when you were up there? Well, yeah, we went up there and we gave an old bow. <laughs> <laughs> That's that's Thanks. one I didn't I never done that Crow Patrick I don't think but um yeah I've heard the story but you have to go up at the crack of dawn you have to yeah, go up I... in the middle of the summer when the days are the longest Did you ever see someone so you can get up much? no <laughs> you have to get up on the crack of dawn yeah yeah so that you can Poor so when down. you're coming back down it's before anybody starts climbing the mountain otherwise you'll be like it's it's steep and it's the rocks are loose so like once you get going you can't really stop and like you know you don't want to. Fucking crashing into people walking up the doing their well, real pilgrimage like the, the, last, commitment the barefoot yeah. and the old shtick like you know yeah. climbing up the hill fuck the last time we did it we went up at two in the morning on the solstice climbed up in the dark got to the top it was a fucking storm but we knew there was a window where the weather was going to calm down got to the top waited it out sunlight just came out there I think it was like four in the morning the daylight was kicking in and we had the whole mountain clean run to the bottom and then we just took off that was with Colin Keegan who else Neil Martin myself and Scott and then we got to the bottom and then the storm pack took on again mm. and we got back to the van so how did you rekindle your relationship and start working together uh, through mountain biking I, I didn't get my first proper adult mountain bike through Gary um, so I didn't even oh, know Gary's shop existed fucking prick. but yeah who are you buying them off? Through the Some online forums bottom. back when people used forums, like there's a mountain biking forums, and somebody said that there was a woods out there in Ross Cahill, and then you know we were looking for that to help build the trails. And I went out, and Gary was there, and he gave me a cup of tea and a bit of food, and he couldn't get rid of me, and that was it. That was it. Now I work from. <laughs> I took I took in a stray dog. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah, yeah. Took him under his Saint Vincent out. to Gary, like he used to throw the old cycling Where clothes were you at me and everything. Before him, I was in Tesco. That was my first job. I only ever did one interview in my life, and that was for Tesco. Did you interview for, for Tesco? Yeah, yeah. When I was sweeping the floor, when I was seventeen, I didn't finish school. But the only the, the only rule was, if I don't do the leaving cert, I was going to get myself a job. So as soon as I got myself a job, then I just fucked off out of school. So how long are you with Gary now? Oh, I don't know. Ten. Well, even before Ten I was years. officially working for Gary, I was always just hanging around doing, going for cycles and doing those video projects and doing bits and pieces and stuff like that like so so with 10 years on the weekends and spare time like 10 years with the mountain bike shop um, i started cycling about 10 years ago the i think biking. what are the biggest changes in 10 years what have you seen happen or what way is the industry going is it saturated 
like everything oh, in there. It's super saturated, but I think the big push right now is electric bikes. Everything's electric. Yeah. Lazy bastards. But Ireland's years behind. They're so like I. Oh, we're way behind. Like last summer, I I don't know where it was. I think it was on one of the industry news that is something, something some crazy number like fifty percent of bikes over in the UK are electric now. All spike sales. Really? Yeah. But they're expensive, so people don't realize the value in what you're you're getting. Like they're they're there's a big upfront cost. But if you buy one of the cheap ones, then you're just going to be riddled with problems. They can't they can't withstand our crap climate. So for the layman that's listening to this. Uh, I had to learn this the hard way. So your mountain bikes. Yeah. So you have your hardtail. That's one with the no suspension on no the back. No suspension on the back. Then you have your full full suspension. Sus- yeah, so it's suspension on the front and on the back, yeah. And then you have an electric bike. Yeah. Or you have a downhill bike. Uh, electric bikes can be any kind of bike, really, as long as it's it's pedal assist. So you pedal it, the motor helps you. And downhill bikes are specific to racing downhill. They're not designed to pedal up a hill or anything like that. That's when you, you start at the top of the hill and you go through a timed gate. You break the laser, the timer starts. You race down to the bottom so of the hill. So it's basically like a race car. Yeah. But it's a different style of cycling, different style of race. And there's cross-country racing where you do laps of a circuit. And there's an enduro, which is more like rallying, where you have a timed stage and then you cycle to the next stage. Mm-hmm. And there's transitions. And then you have another timed stage. You come down and you cycle back up to another stage. What's a popular bike that's shy? That's a good one. Oh, I don't know. I don't know on brands, but just... Say, when I, when I started doing mountain biking, the only bikes that I would have known would have been Trek Giant. They would have been the only ones They're I would have... They're still there. They're still there. Mm, they're the biggest Trek Giant, specialised. The three big th- big ones, like. I think the big thing I noticed is the death trap machines that people say, I'm going to buy a full suspension for €215 Euros online. And you see this thing come out and you're like, it's just going to rattle to bits. Mm. Just There's a pogo spring in there That if it goes to full compression It's going to send you to the moon <laughs> Or the ones that uh, They sell out of car dealerships Like you, oh, yeah. You, yeah yeah, You go into a car dealership And you buy your car And then you buy a, You know This class Bike that's Branded, branded. to be the same as your car I'm not going to say Name brands like But I've seen some awful ones And it's like Full carbon fibre But it's just The cheapest knockoff Piece of crap That they stick their stickers on and then that's think that they've got this great high end mountain bike, and, and then shape. they go and they go take it off road, and they're they're lucky they don't die. <laughs> that bad, yeah. And carbon fiber or metal aluminium? What? If I had the money, I'd go titanium. Why the fuck? What is th- what's the thing with titanium? It's class. <laughs> In what way? <laughs> Tell me, like I'm a four year old. What? Why it's titanium? It's a hand built. It's a it's a full hand hand built process. Boutique. So in other words, it, in, it's fancy to have or it will never break? Both. Both. And if, say, if titanium breaks, it can be just welded again. It doesn't need to go through the heat treatment. Nothing. It, it's um, it's it's the, the compliance in it, like it's so, the comfort levels on titanium are unreal as well. Like they have the same as what steel is, but half the weight. Yeah, so like aluminium is light, but it's a very rigid and harsh material so, so you want the frame bending yeah, flexible. flexible yeah so aluminium is hard so when you're cycling over rough stuff you're getting rattled carbon fiber is light but then they can design the frame so that it can be flexible but if you crash a carbon fiber bike it's fucked in the bin you can't trust it anymore steel is heavier but it's a flexible softer material so it absorbs a lot of the impacts and the vibrations whereas titanium doesn't rust like aluminium it's light like carbon fiber and it's soft like steel. So, but you're paying a fucking fortune for it. Like, I so mean, for, corrode like alloy. So. For, for Johnny starting yeah. off on a bike, you, you often said to me, hardtail is the best. Yeah. And the, the apprenticeship. The soft tail is just hard to cycle up hills and stuff like that, is it? It depends on how well it's designed. But like, you need to buy a bike for what you're, you're doing. But like, you can get a really good hardtail, a real top quality hardtail for the same price of a low end full suspension bike. You know, so because there's more moving parts on a full suspension bike and the rear shock on it and everything, you're just paying more because there's more stuff on it. But like for two and a half grand, you get an entry level kind of full suspension bike. But for two and a half grand, you get a really, really good hardtail. Okay. You know, better quality wheels, better quality brakes, better quality gears, better quality suspension fork. Everything on it would be good. Whereas a two and a half grand full suspension bike would be like the equivalent of maybe a thousand euro hardtail. Who does the Brimble brakes of bikes? 
Hope. Trick stuff. Trick stuff for a new one. Hope, hope make really good stuff. And the, the great thing about Hope is it's all machined and made and everything in the, the UK, but they're serviceable. You can get every last tiny little spare part for them. So if you have any issues, you can just take everything apart and fix and put them back together again. They're not disposable. What was the COVID like for bikes and bike shops and because we, I can't. I have a clothes shop now with no clothes to sell. <laughs> it, it was a <laughs> double-edged sword, really, wasn't yeah. it? Like, because when COVID happened, everything got closed. You couldn't do anything but walk, jog, and cycle. So, like, I was bombarded with people looking for bits, and there, the bikes just disappeared. All the bike stock got wiped out. So everybody was digging bits out of their shed, get fit, getting stuff fixed up. So then parts and pieces just got stock got wiped out. And then shipping times were really, really bad because, you know, this was at the very start of it. Like, so there was loads and loads of business and people were just throwing money at but you. But no stuff. But no stuff, no, no stuff. stock, no bikes. Like at one point. And you had specialized in one bike brand, a niche uh, bike brand. Well, it's not too niche, but again, it's just the one brand you're working with. And I think it wasn't a good thing because like we used to be able to get in other brands for people we used to be kind of that we were that bike shop that you come and Whatever you i want to. this we'd research it and get it but then with covid just everything got stopped nobody could get anything for anybody and it was only certain brands that through covid maybe had good orders sitting that got ahead of everybody else mm. on purchasing so i think there was only like i think there was only two brands out there that actually jumped the gun on everybody mm. like if you were the bikes kind of work the same way as a car dealership like you know you'll have a ford place but you're not going to have another ford place right beside that yeah so for example if there's a guy selling trek we're not going to be selling trek next door to him but because trek is a giant company they have the buy-in power to get that kind of stuff so the guy next door to us with trek will have all the trek bikes but we don't yeah because we do the smaller brands where the smaller brands might be a little bit more niche a little bit boutique a little bit nicer and better but they don't have the buying power to go over to China and say, okay, give me 10 million bikes. Yeah. They'd be saying, give me 5,000 bikes. So they would cough for parts the same as everyone else was. Yeah, pretty much. But it's, it's every industry. Yeah, it was every everything industry. like, but yeah. bikes are the same thing. But bike, the, the cycling popularity exploded. Everybody wanted to do it. But then we were, you know, stuck with, without the stock. I think in the space of one week with COVID, I think 200,000 people in Ireland took up cycling. Wow. Well. I had a repair queue of about 65 bikes and three to three and a half weeks of a wait when COVID, and like, and we didn't have the shop open, so I was dealing with everybody at the front door. And even if we had the shop open, I couldn't have let anybody in because I was falling over bikes in there. Fuck. Just with repairs to get done. It's mad, isn't it? So it was good but bad at the same time, like. It's some shit show. Even it now. It still is. Like I mean, there's it, nothing can be got still. Like, do you think things have got better? Mm, I no. think things have got worse. It's uh, shipping times have gotten better, but me. that's just from distributors. But the problem is, if distributors don't have the stock, they can't ship it. So, like, there's there's stuff there where you'd you'd check the um the shipping date to be out of stock, and you get a back order, and it's like a year and a half away, like just for some chains that you need now. Yeah, yeah. Shimano, like, are their orders? Their order schedule is mad. Like, you're ordering now for next year. Are they Chinese? Japan. Shimano's Jap Japanese. I shouldn't know him by name. I should have just said it in a in a Shimano. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> An oriental voice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's it's mad when, when I um I started hanging with Gary, we started doing the bike shop and I was in the infancy of doing my social media and stuff. And it gets to a certain point where you uh if you want to stay independent you have to either take stupid ads that you don't want to do or you start selling clothes and the two lads helped me set up my my shop <laughs> you did especially yeah, yeah. but i remember going down and so clueless like i i didn't know anything like anything about selling one thing setting up the shop setting up the shopify system i remember going down and sitting with you and you going through it as if it was the simplest thing ever and i go oh my god i'm never gonna, be able to do this. <laughs> I figured it out now. I'm doing well now. I figured it out now, but it's it's crazy that I'm doing a business now that I'm so frustrated with because I can't get anything. Like it's so hard to get stuff. You make an order, and you're you pay for it, and then you're waiting for it to come, and then it doesn't come, and you just have so little control. And I, I'm like, I don't know how anyone does it. I don't know how 
anyone does it. Like I'm just worrying about I'm just have harmless stuff, but I wouldn't like to be doing like how many different parts would you have to have? Yeah, parts it is so many different products and pieces and bits and every year new stuff comes out so the old parts don't work anymore. But like on our shop we've got something like two and a half thousand products. And a lot of that would just be little things. Sixty bearings. different types of bearings. Nipples. Spokes. Yeah, nipples. I love nipples. Especially but yeah, like one. all the different wheels have all different size bearings. So I don't know how many different types of bearings we have or derailleur hangers, the bit that attaches the gear onto the frame. And every manufacturer has a different design and every bike within that manufacturer will be a different design. But when you have a type of bike, say mine is a big Hanzo DL, like how yeah. many, like the big Hanzo, how many sizes did that come in of that frame? Extra small, small, medium, large, so and extra how large. do you know what ones to get? And not be stuck with them. Well, you'd sell more medium and larges than you would smalls and extra though, smalls. Like so, when you do your pre-order, like a year to a year and a half in advance, that's what you'd be going for. Like what you, you'd know. Like there's trends every year, so you know what you need. Like you might get in one or two extra larges because there'd be so there'd all be somebody looking for something, or you know the smalls. But the vast, the vast majority of people would be needing either mediums or larges. It's a man when you came rocking around leash. How many people started riding? Um, like corner bikes. I know. Like there's so many from around mm. bought bikes off you. Yeah, and uh, we set up um like with Kona there, I we set up a dealer in Port Leash as well. And they're doing pretty good out of it now as well. Like Kona has that good reputation of a brand, so there's a, but like with the number of bikes, yeah, you'd always see one nearly in every spin out you'd see some some brand, you know, something with the Kona brand on. But they're not, they're not new, like, they've been going for over 30 years. Yeah. Like the same age as myself, 34 years, like, so. You're only 34. Only. Jeez, he's only a chap, isn't he? I'm an old fella. You, you're not old. Why are you? I'll be 47 this year. Are you 47? This year. Je- how well is he after looking after himself? Look at him. With all the crashes and the motocross bikes and the, the stress he does put himself under. Now he's taking it oh, easy to see in the fancy digger. You have had a few big crashes. Or had. I had one miller of a crash in the motorbike, multiple brakes, puncture, I got a handlebar into the side, broke the ankle, broke the foot, dislocated a bone in my back. Oh, it cost a lad in front of you didn't commit. Yeah. What? Explain that. You got to commit. When you see a big <laughs> jump and you're going for it, you have to go through every gear in the box to make it. And you have the bike just pinned because you know when you hit it, yeah, I think the gap was something like 90 foot. So I have Fuck to clear off! Yeah. Do you need a picture of that? No. A ninety you, foot gap. Bring That's up a um, picture of Desert Martin, the motocross track. Give you an idea. There's What's one there. There's like I think there's one jump there. It was. Like what is it? It's a hundred and ten foot or something. Um, hundred and ten foot. No, what am I looking for? Uh, Desert Martin motocross track. And you had Desert loads Martin. of lads and left, right. Yeah. Back oh, it's front. Cl- I love the start, the commitment, the carnage. Like you pick a point on the track and the gate and there could be 40 riders in the line and you have to open it and they could be banging elbows off them and just drive them out. You just have to stay committed. Even if the lad falls out in front of you, you drive over him. There'd be no hard feelings. Ah, stop. I know. There's no hard feelings. We all know what we've signed up to. Well, I can tell you now, you drive over me, I'm going to have hard feelings. Over. There's <laughs> something there up on the screen. There's a couple of images of it. Just Google images like. There you Is go. that where you hurt yourself? Yeah. No, I did well in a couple of races there, but just one. Where is that? Uh, it's up in Northern Ireland. It's a GP track. So, is that still going? Yep. And that's where you broke yourself up in Shay. Yep. Yeah. I had to come down then. I wouldn't mind. I had to come down, right? I was in a bad enough way, but I had to get a machine off because I had a low loader booked. So I had to go down <laughs> after I was licking my wounds for one day. Load the machine, get onto the trailer, and then go back, and then go to the hospital. <laughs> Fuck hell. The Thank joys of working for yourself. Well, no wonder you're not doing that anymore because that's fucking too dangerous. But, um, no, it is a high adrenaline sport. You but the community the, is great. You haven't been lads. on the bike too much now. The which? You haven't been on the bike too much now. No. Is that me that's putting you on the Yeah, it's you, you flute. <laughs> <laughs> Dave Cuddy ended my cycling career because yeah. I had to build stuff for him oh, and work a job. I know, I know. It's been mental last way, hasn't it? Did we have Christmas this year? No. It was... It was, it was what mad. happened this Christmas? I remember working it. Yeah, it was all a big mess. All a big mess. I had so many different plans. 
for Christmas. I was supposed to take December off and I was supposed to <laughs> concentrate on the shop and Gary was going concentrating on getting the podcast room done and we were we had so much going on. And reality gave you a swift uh, kick in the uh, balls. Well, the machines didn't come, so <laughs> I had to stay working with Gary and Greg because I can't let him down. And I never took holidays last year. So I worked all through the year and I kept saying to Vicky, don't worry, I'm off in December. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was your busiest month. But I know that I can't go on holidays with my family this year, but I'm off all December. So I'll work, I'll get up at normal time, I'll get up like I would go into work, I'll get up at half five, six o'clock, I'll go into the office and around five, six o'clock in the evening, I'll finish and we'll be grand, it'll be okay. Machines didn't come, couldn't do that. Then me and Vicky ended up staying up all night working and got, it, was, it was so stressful and couldn't get stuff. I had a shop and I'd get stuff and then it'd be gone. And then since Christmas, it's been like, uh, uh, just can't get stuff. Can't get stuff. And like, this is this is after working out grand. It's a, it's a great job. I do feel a little bit guilty that I'm after putting so much time on the whole thing. And you love it, don't you? <laughs> it's all right if you're stuck, like it'll do. <laughs> <laughs> but please, God, it, um, I look, I think new challenges, we need new challenges all the time. You do. And you have to push yourself. Yeah. And and don't be afraid to try something. Yeah. Because then if it doesn't work out. It doesn't work out. Go it doesn't work else. out. But that's been always the case. That's always the case. You have to just do stuff. You just We've did. tried so much stuff like and you have you have to do it like and you won't be at peace with yourself if you don't try it because then it's always in the back of your head. Oh, I should have done this. I should have done that. Yeah. Yeah. I know. It's mad. It's mad. And the whole social media thing is. It's a crazy one. I was only thinking about it last night. Cause sometimes you do question things. You know, I do a yeah. question thing and you're going through questions and some people had sent you a question and it's like, <laughs> you, you just say, fuck, they just, they just wished I was dead. <laughs> 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 That's interesting. And then you're thinking, God, you know, isn't it crazy? Like you, if you let it get on top of you. Now, I don't. But you are, you've been active on social media a lot. I used to be. I think I was... I think all my adventures and bike stuff, I grew, we grew a good account, like say with following, but it was before video was kicking in. It was all about pictures. So like when people are seeing pictures, of these places you were at, you know, they'd, they, they go fairly viral and some of the videos, you know, little clips. Mm. But I think when the whole thing changed, well, algorithm was one thing, I think that put the brakes on it and then just the way things changed. But I think when things went into more video and more just vlogging stuff out, and I didn't really get into that side of it. I think I'm more a show and tell. This is the plus you got busy. Plus you got very busy. Yeah, and you get busy, and like you know yourself, anything to do with Instagram, it gets time. Mm. Well, everyone, because you you've always been productive in what you do, and yeah. you've always tried to do something, so you always try different things. Yeah, is that from family or friends or people you surround yourself with? I think some. I think it's. I've, I'd be very curious and seeing stuff and I just love, I just love looking into different industries and if something's there that grabs your attention, you're like, wow, I'd love to lo know more. And then if you see an angle that you could actually get the experience to work in it and try it out and see what it's like, go for it, you know. Is the, the building industry is kind of fucked, isn't it? You know, oh, it's a minefield right now. Like it, it's, it's good, but at the same time, there's so much red tape about every job now. You need to try and take on something that doesn't have as much red tape in it just to get on so your head's not bright. I think once the government gets their bead little dick beaters on everything, they put so much red tape on and rules in that stuff can't be done. I don't yeah. know. I know nothing about it. I think the other thing with construction too Try and do is something. <laughs> <laughs> you won't be long figuring it out. I think the big thing, the big problem with construction is like, you know, you kind of have to like if you were to go out now and try and assemble a team to go working together, good luck. Like right now, it's very hard to get people that are willing to put in hard work. You know, it's it's not really built into a lot of people at the moment. And I'm, I don't know if I should be saying that, but it's, it's cons like construction is hard work. and But you have to be quick thinking and on the go and you have to be conscious of a lot of stuff. And you see a lot of young lads just walking around with a phone in their hand there, like, you know, at work. Like there should be nearly a box in the job that you fire all your gear into and leave it. Mm. Waiting to be told what to do instead of yeah. taking a bit of initiative and knowing what to do next, yeah. or at least asking what to do next. Yeah. No, because uh, safety on work is a big thing too. Like, so you can't have distractions. You have to, like, there's certain work 
you take on then if it is dangerous you have to know that the guy that's with you has your back and has your safety in mind as well it's like especially where we're working now like in the woods you know how dangerous it, dangerous it's in there like doing stuff yeah there's um there's a fierce you're working in limerick is it yeah there's an awful lot of opportunity to come sexual rapist <laughs> <laughs> oh i better watch that then <laughs> you could have too good a time no have you a detector for that? No, 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 no. Just you don't, 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 don't wear as tight trousers. Okay. You know, Anything you, else? Yeah, yeah. J- always keep your top on. Okay. Anything? And just... Oh, what about eyewear? Helmets? No, 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 like no, that? You're grand, no. You're grand. You're grand. You can, there's nothing Safety there. glasses? Yeah, there's only a certain area of your body you have to take care of. Quick one. Any big words lately? <laughs> Gary, every so often, sends me a big word and says, use that in your story. And I'd be like, okay, I'll try it. Can you tell me what it means? <laughs> <laughs> because I mightn't even know. Go on, give me one that I'll use it on the way home. Exponential. I know what that is. That, that Debacle. I know what that is as well. Yeah, it's just, a, but it's still a class word, like jaunty. What's that mean? When something's a bit quirky or crooked or anything, like, you know. Jaunty. Yeah, you got your hat at a jaunty angle, you know, it's a bit fucking off to one side, like. Aye. Never Jaunty's a great word. It's an old word. Jaunty. Jaunty, yeah. I rather mid up once. My like my girlfriend now she's Hungarian and sometimes when I say words like jaunty or debacle, she's convinced I'm making up words because I. <laughs> so sometimes when I'm talking shite and everybody else that knows me knows when I when I'm talking, and I sound like I'm really confident about what I'm saying. Yeah, I'm making it up. <laughs> I think there's a lot of people who do that to me to try and frighten me. Like I heard that if you wank hard enough, you can burst your appendix. Yeah, that's true. And so, is that true? <laughs> I don't fucking know. <laughs> See, I don't know, and it scares me now. But you said that with confidence. Yeah, yeah, you right. said that with yeah, confidence, yeah. and now uh, that I believe it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that better not. Not the true. week you were off sick. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Appendix. yeah. You should want to be careful. The only appendix. I move over. I've gone through about three appendixes now. <laughs> I think. <laughs> <laughs> right, lads. Uh, thanks for listening, and uh, I hope you have a great week. Good luck. <laughs>